So this morning's uh, scripture is from Romans chapter 7, verse 13, through chapter 8, verse 4. All right, so Romans chapter 7, verse 13. Did what is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin that was working death in me through what is good, in order that it might be shown to be sin, so that through the commandment, sin might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. Verse 17, but in fact, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. Verse 21, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind I am enslaved to the law of God, but with my flesh I am enslaved to the law of sin. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Just a minute here. I'm going to have to arrange this a little differently. It would be awful if I dropped all my notes. That is one of my worst nightmares. Getting up to preach and I don't have my notes. <laughs> That's just preacher's nightmare. That's all that is. Well, the peace of Christ, Christ who is our peace, Christ who gives us peace, be with you. I receive it. <laughs> Interpretation of the Bible, and it always has to be interpreted, demands a framework within which the details of the Scripture are then set. It's very important to know the big picture so we can clearly understand the details. There are several ways to express big picture thinking. Big picture thinking is a major thing around here. I hope you heard Michelle saying what the children are going to be learning in Bible school. That is big picture thinking. Big picture thinking. A lot of ways that can be expressed. Here's just one of them. The Bible is a book about the future in light of the glaring human failures of both the past and the present. 
The sweep is from creation to new creation by way of the fall and redemption. There are other ways that could be put. So in the Bible, though, the purposes and goals of the triune God from creation in Genesis to the revelation of Jesus in the last book of the canon find their fulfillment and centering in Jesus, who is both Son of God, Son of Man, Savior, second person of the Trinity, who is, in regards to humanity, perfect man, and in regards to Israel, this people whom God chose, becoming both true Israel, the chosen one, renewed Israel, perfected and fulfilled Israel, as well as second and last Adam. And he fully expresses, fully reveals Father and Spirit. Thus, he will bring the eternal purposes of God to complete fulfillment. And here's what Paul says is going to happen at the end, that God may be all in all. Now, we are people who need to get that big picture all the time. And in the Bible, God does all of this by a series of covenants. We've talked about this a lot. A covenant is a promise, but a covenant is a bond. It is designed to create a union, like a marriage covenant, designed to create a union to becoming one. And he does this a series of covenants. What we call the Old Covenant, or the Old Testament, contains these covenants. The covenant of creation, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic one, the Mosaic one, the Davidic covenant, and then the prophecies and promises of what Jeremiah and Ezekiel called a new covenant. A new covenant. So all of the older covenants contained in the what we call the 39 documents of the Old Testament are extremely important, every single one of them. They all reveal God in, in varying ways, and it takes all of them to reveal the greatness of our God. But they all merge and come to a fulfillment in the new covenant. And so the writer of Hebrews makes a big distinction between the older covenants and the new covenant. These new, the, the new covenant, in a lot of detail, is revealed in the 27 documents we call the New Testament. And so what we find here is that all the bloody sacrifices that were contained in the old covenant, every time there was bloodletting, are subsumed in the cross of the Lord Jesus, who is the perfect sacrifice. Writer of Hebrews says, a better sacrifice. Then his resurrection from the dead, his ascension to the right hand of Father, his sending the Holy Spirit who comes in power. In the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus is at a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. And on the very last day of that feast, it was the most important of all the days, and great things happened on those days. And at one point, at the very highlight of that great feast and the processions that we're having and the water being poured out and the wine being poured out, we are told that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he said this, If any man is thirsty... Let him come to me. Hmm. Let the man come and drink who believes in me. As the Scripture says, and that's all the Old Testament, from his breast, that is heart, and this refers to Jesus himself at first, from him flows out fountains of living water, and that water goes into us, and we become then, found out of our inmost being, a fountain of living water, but it starts with Him. And then He says, He was speaking of the Spirit, 
Hmm. Which those who believed in him were to receive. For there was no spirit, let me clarify that, in the sense of a fullness, in the sense of a a special fulfillment of Joel. They knew all about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, of course. But there was no spirit in that sense that's coming, this poured out one, as yet, Jesus said, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, Jesus was glorified, and this is hard to take in, but you must believe it. He was glorified at the cross. The vast glory of God was revealed in his death. He was glorified in his resurrection. And now, now he has poured out Holy Spirit upon all who believe. Believers are now living in what the Bible calls the beginning of the age to come. Two ages in the Bible. The the old age and the new age. The age that is now the new age that is to come, and we are in the overlap of that. And so, under the new covenant that is foundationed in the blood of Jesus, another translation for the word covenant in the Old Testament is berit, and berit always carries with it the concept of a cutting, a sacrifice, a bloodletting. And so, in this time, we are eagerly awaiting His second coming, resulting in our receiving new bodies. I'm ready for that. Entry into the eternal kingdom and the spirit now received is what is called, he's called the down payment, the guarantor of that great salvation that is ours in Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, he says, verses 8 and 9, I won't get to that today, but I'm going to quote it. In fact, he says, talking to the Roman church, Unless you possess the Spirit of Christ, you would not belong to Him. I'm going to give you another translation of that. Anyone who doesn't have the Spirit of and from the Messiah doesn't belong to Him. So last week, Joshua wonderfully reminded us that as he did the first part of the chapter 7 of the book of Romans, that all of Romans 7 is fundamentally and basically about the Jew and his relationship with his understanding of the law, the first five books of the Bible called the Torah. And Paul, of course, is a Jew, calls himself a Pharisee, the most strict sect, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and that the law was the controlling document in his whole life, as it would be for any pious Jew the controlling document. So in Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, Paul says, brothers. So he's talking to Jews as a Jew, as a Jew now. So the the primary thing, and it's not that Christians can't find uh, help in all of chapter 7, but it's primarily written to Jews who are living under the law as their whole life. And so he says, brothers, those of you who have studied law, I don't have time to go into this, but Paul uses the word Torah four different ways in these passages. Interesting, I'll, I'll point some of them out. So chapter 7, of course, all of it has relevancy to Christians in a sense, in a sense, but we are not under law like that. We are spirit people. We are new covenant people. And the primary concern of chapter 7 is a contrast between Jews like Paul who are very pious and very careful, a Pharisee, keeping the old law, and then Paul or anybody under the new covenant. There's a contrast between those two lives. After the cross... After the full salvific work of Jesus, Jews under the old law must not continue to cling to it as an instrument of salvation or even an instrument of righteousness before God. In fact, in a Jew's or any other person's rejection 
of the salvation wrought by the action of God in Christ, and God in Christ was making reconciliation for the whole world, that very law, the Torah, though good and holy and perfect, becomes for them an instrument of death. Oh, it wasn't intended for that, but it became that. Not life. The new covenant, according to the writer of Hebrews, is better in all ways to the older covenants. And actually, the new covenant is not made exclusively with either ethnic or national Israel. The old covenants were, especially the Mosaic. The new covenant is made by God in Christ, who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, includes all nations, all peoples, all tribes, everybody in the whole world who will receive Christ as Lord because God so loved the world and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice. Now, Paul knows full well how a non-Christian Jew might feel about the law of Moses. Like David. David said, I love your law, O God. I approve it. I delight in it. But that same Jew, even like David, who would say that, will always find that he's unable to fully obey it or even to do well. In stark contrast to life in the Spirit, life under the law, not life of the Spirit, life under the law is described like this being sold as a slave to sin. And I want you to think of sin with a capital S. Sin personified, a power. Sold like a slave to sin. Not understanding my own behavior. Unable to not do the things I hate. And because I do know the law, I become a prisoner of sin. My new master and therefore I am a wretched man. That's not a good life. That's not a good life. And that is not the experience of a person who is in Christ and who has received Holy Spirit. Paul says that. Why not? Why? Because he starts with this reality. The Christian has died in principle, with Christ, and therefore is freed from sin. When Paul says, when Christ died, I died. I am what? Crucified with Christ. And so, in principle, we are freed from sin. Last week, Josh did a wonderful way, and Paul used it. He says, just like the wife whose husband died is now free to marry a living person, Sin no longer reigns over us because we've died to sin, and thus we've died to the law with its sin produces death revelation. The wages of sin is what? Death. So, now, be careful here now. Listen up. I wrote listen up in my notes. (laughs) And for your information, I put an exclamation point. (laughs) It is true. It is true that Christians enter into some very continuing struggles with sin. That's true. We confess our sin. If any man sin, and John assumes that there will be, if any man sins, we, he said, I'm, I'm writing so you don't sin. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, and he go, Jesus Christ the right. So what do we do? We confess our sins, but... So we, we struggle. Because why? Well, because we, even after the Spirit comes, we still have an old nature. We still have a, what's called a fallen nature. And I don't know whether you know it or not, but we live in decaying bodies. Hmm. I wish that weren't true sometimes, but it is. So that's, that's, that's the case. But we now may and can walk in and by the Holy Spirit and therefore fulfill the law that it was intended as a way to stay in good favor with our Master. 
the righteousness of the law, which Jesus defined as, as the whole fulfillment, is love God with all of your being and love your neighbor as yourself. We are now, by the Holy Spirit, enabled to do that. We do not have to sin. We are now indwelled by the Spirit of God. Our very bodies are the temple, the house in which God the Spirit lives. And we are now able, unlike the wretched man, to do good. We can do good. We can keep the intent of the law. Whereas in the other case, he said, I'm unable to do good. I'm unable. But now we can. We can do good. We can keep the intent of the law. And we can walk and grow in grace. So, what, what is, where's, what's our position? Well, we're, we now belong to what we call the new age. Now, some people don't like that, but we do. Only two ages, old and new. The new era, which began with Jesus... And for us, it is marked by our baptism. You are baptized into his death, marked by baptism. It's marked by receiving God the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.13 says, the Spirit of God, we are stamped with the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. All covenants are marked by signs and seals. New covenant is marked by baptism. And the Lord's table, but the major mark, the major seal, is God, the Holy Spirit Himself. Amen. Stamped, marked. So, I love this little quotation from Dr. Wright. He says this, Paul's doctrine of the Spirit is far more characteristic and central, notice those words, characteristic and central, than even his doctrine of justification by faith. Now, he goes on after that statement to say, and justification by faith is a doctrine that's absolutely foundational for Christian life. Foundational. We are saved by faith. We are children of Abraham who believed God and God counted it as right standing with God. We believe God. We believe what He has done for us. And He counts us as and declares us as forgiven, justified, no condemnation, all be on the basis of faith in what God in Christ has done. So, brothers, we got to make a lot of theology. Some people say, oh, I don't want to be in theology. Yeah, you do. Theology means the study of God. We want to learn everything we can about our Master and Lord. Wonderful to do that, of course. So, when I say that, some people say, well, it, that's just kind of an intellectual thing. Well, it is that, but it's not just that. It's not just that. Actually, we, we are called to come to know God. And that is an experiential, ongoing, real, personal relationship. A life lived in the presence of God. And then the law... What the law as law could never provide, we have. It, the law couldn't do that because of our weakness and our old nature dominated us. Now it need not do that. And so we find in the great 8th chapter of Romans, and I have to tell you, 8th chapter of Romans is probably the greatest chapter in the Bible. I'll say that and then I'll read Deuteronomy someplace and I'll say, oh, that's a big... <laughs> But I, can't, I don't know where you'd go to find a greater chapter. In the, if you just wanted to champ at one chapter for a long time, boy, that'd be a good one to do. The eighth chapter of Romans. And here, of course, the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, Numa, is the focus of discussion, particularly in chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. Not the Spirit himself. This is always amazing to me. The Holy Spirit rarely, if ever, speaks of himself. <laughs> Isn't that something? I, I, this is, God always continues to amaze me. He doesn't speak of himself. But we do learn about the Spirit himself by what he does. And so Paul in this passage talks about the Spirit. All, it's all about the Spirit. But he begins, of course, as he must 
by talking about Christ Jesus, whose complete work enabled the gift of the Spirit. Christ is the gift of God. The Spirit is the gift of God, the charis, the, the, the one who comes as a gift. From the eighth chapter of Romans, I'll give you a big overview of that. From 8.1, no condemnation, to 8.35, no separation. All of Romans 8 is about many things, but it's about assurance of salvation because of the greatness of our salvation in Christ Jesus. God wants you to be assured that you are His. He wants you to walk in a large measure of assurance before the Lord because He loves you. So Romans 8 is about that. And in Christ Jesus, life, which, which He describes as life in the Spirit, what it does, it produces a radical change from a sin-dominated existence, the law of sin and death. That's one way it uses law. It's the law of sin and death. A sin-dominated existence. I'm always thinking about I'm, I'm under condemnation and guilt. Two, a life that is dominated by love, joy, and peace because these are the marks of the kingdom of God by the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit that we receive, the Holy Spirit, begins to teach us. And the first thing He'll say to you is, uh, you really are now a son of God. Right now, you're a child of God. You really are going to be enabled to pray well through infirmities, through tribulations, through tests and temptations. You're going to be able to pray well through these because I am going to shed the love of God abroad in you. You're going to, you're going to come away with, the Lord really does love me. And know it, know it, and nobody can shake you from it. He's going to remind you that you shall yet be glorified. Yes. Woo, that's good. I want to tell you again this morning, the Holy Spirit's a person, a person, a person. He's the third person of God, the Trinitarian God. So don't call Holy Spirit it, please. He's a person. Actually, this is the way I like to put it. He's God's personal presence. And that presence is an empowering presence. There's power associated with God in every respect. He is called the Almighty God for a good reason, because He has all authority and all might and all power. And he now dwells with men. This is his purpose, to dwell with men. He's also called the Spirit, Paul calls him here, the Spirit of Christ Jesus. Now Jesus, in his earth walk particularly, put a, what I call a human face on God the Father. Remember when he said to Philip one time, Lord, uh, Philip, have you been so long with me? And you say, show me the Father. What do you say? He who has seen me, Jesus said, has seen the Father. The Father. So, and then he's called paraclete. Wonderful Greek word, parakletos. Kletos is a Greek word meaning to call. And para, the prefix, means alongside. So one who is called alongside and it carries with it the idea of being a helper, a standby, a strengthener, and I like the word advocate. Jesus is an advocate, and naturally the Holy Spirit is an advocate because Jesus said, He will be just like me, of course, of course. And so Jesus then puts a human face on Holy Spirit. And Paul, like all the rest of the Bible, is thoroughly Trinitarian. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So life now and in the future for the Christian is to be an empowered life. He dwells in us. We are living now in between the times, between the time of the first coming of Jesus and His second coming. Between the times. We live now in 
what one writer called the radical middle. <laughs> That's true. The radical middle. And there's tension there. And around here we use this phrase, the already and the not yet. Tension. So even now, in this pre-consummation time, we will see the working. We can believe to see, and if we will, we'll see the working of miracles. We will see all the rest of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians chapters 12-14. through 14. The gift of prophecy, the gift of faith, the gifts of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of recognizing unclean spirits and learning how to cast them out. The gift of unlearned languages and the, the ability of to interpret those unlearned languages. And there are other gifts, and we will see them now. But at the same time, we will experience the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Oh my, that's part of it, Christ's sufferings. Paul himself, who wrote this, here's what he says, I know insults and hardships, and these are all words he used, insults, hardships, persecutions, agonies, imprisonments, shipwreck, hunger, thirst, often he says starving, cold, and without proper clothes. And yet, and yet, all of this between the times without frustration. <laughs> and he'll say things like, I don't worry about anything. I can do all things through Christ who's my strength. He said that when he's in prison. <laughs> I can do all things. I can do whatever God... We do live between the times. And all those things are true at the same time. And so, Jesus said, you're going to receive... We begin to receive the kingdom now. And then he says, with persecutions. Sometimes we don't like to add that, but there it is. So, let's wind this up here by going to Romans chapter 8. Verses 1 and 2, I'm going to read uh, a modern translation. So therefore, after all we said about chapter 7 now, so therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Messiah Jesus. Under the law, there's nothing but condemnation because we're weak and beggarly and sin there can't be the law wasn't intended that way but he couldn't do otherwise under the law there was nothing but guilt nothing but condemnation because you a pious jew knew he couldn't keep it he wasn't keeping it but he says now there is no judging as guilty condemnation for those in the messiah jesus why not because the law and here's another use of the law the new law <laughs> The new law, the new Torah of the spirit of life in the Messiah Jesus released you from the law, the old law of sin and death. Isn't that wonderful? Life in the new era of the new covenant, we live in a place of no condemnation by God. No punishment. God is not punishing you under, under destruction. He will discipline you because He loves you, but no condemnation. For those who by the Spirit will live in union with Christ, that is, incorporated into the sphere of power and authority, confessing now Jesus is Lord, we come into that sphere where there's only one true Lord, and He's Christ Jesus. We are free now from the operation of God's just wrath, which will happen at the final judgment. The last judgment, the age of the old covenant with its institutions, sacrificial atonement for sin, has for those in Christ Jesus ended. But now, after Christ's death, there is no atonement available through the Mosaic covenant. I want you to hear that, please. People say, well, what about... Thus and thus and thus. Somebody's trying to do good. No, no. There is only atoning sacrifice in Jesus. Peter, in Acts chapter 4, is speaking before the, the court, the high court of the Jewish nation, the Sanhedrin. Real Jews, thank you. And he looks straight at them, and here's what he says. There is no other name under heaven 
given among men whereby we must be saved. That name is Jesus. I'm going to give you another translation. For all the names in the world given to men, this name, Jesus Christ the Nazarene, is the only one by which we can be saved. Oh, that sounds so exclusive. It is. It is. There are not many ways to come before God without condemnation. There's only one way, but God's made it for us, all who will believe. Then Romans 8, 3, and 4 explain verse 1. For God, why is all that true? For God has done what the law, here we're talking about the Torah, the old law, being weak because of human nature, human flesh, was incapable of doing. God, what what God? Then he sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, is, is Jesus, did he ever sin? Not at all. We're told he is without sin. Without sin. At one place he actually says, which one of you is going to convict me of sin? And there was dead silence. But he sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering, an atoning sacrifice. And right there in his body, in the flesh, he, God, condemned sin. I want you to note that, please. This was in order that the right and proper verdict of the law could be fulfilled in us as we live, not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God condemned sin so that the laws, the law was intended to be life, life-giving, do this and live, so that the life-giving verdict of the law could be fulfilled in us by the Spirit, according to the Spirit, as He constitutes the new way, the new mode in which the living presence of God Himself will dwell in us, with His people, and, and He comes and He calls us a new house, a new temple, a house for His name. I want you to know when Jesus died, God in Christ dealt with sin with a capital S. And that's the meaning of the crucifixion of Jesus. The Father did not condemn Jesus. How could He possibly? He was without sin. He was without. He did not become sin. He became a sin offering. You had to be perfect to be a sin offering. He, God, in, when Christ died, He was condemning sin. He identified it. He revealed it. And in the death of Christ. So Father didn't condemn Jesus. He condemned sin in the body that is the flesh of the Messiah Jesus. When God gave the law to begin with, do you think he knew that there were going to be two sides to that? Well, he he said so. If you keep it, wonderful. There's going to be a lot of good things that happen. If you don't, there's death that comes. And he knew that. And so when he gave the law, he was intending to deal with sin. The law actually (laughs) revealed sin as it really is. Most human beings have a very low view of sin. Uh, I just made a mistake. I I just, uh, I mean, it wasn't all that bad. I'm not Hitler. Have you ever heard that one? I'm, well, I'm a very low view of sin. God doesn't have a low view of sin. And we're not to have a low view of sin. We're to hate it. Now, he, sent, he gives the law, and Paul describes it like this, good, holy, perfect. It is. It's good. But because men are hard-hearted, and I use that term because that's exactly the way Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, in his last sermon to, uh, uh, to the nation before Moses' death, he said, I know you're hard-hearted. You've been hard-hearted ever since I, you came out of Egypt. I've had trouble with you. There was a time when I, you just went off the rails and were worshiping. You know, hard-hearted. The law is good, but men aren't. So the law, according to Moses, the law 
made sin full. They, you begin to see what sin really does, what it really is. And so the law became an instrument of death. He says there was a sequence, an historical sequence, starting with Adam and Eve, all the way through to Jesus, sin was increasing, 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 increasing. It increased, it increased, it needed to be dealt with. This is an illustration I heard Dr. Wright give, and I thought it was a good one. He said, I want you to imagine, use your imagination now, of sin as a small, transparent photograph. Got that? Sin, capital S, a small, transparent photograph. And it just looks so innocuous. It's just this little photograph. But here comes the law in its brightness, in its perfections, and it gets behind that little transparent photograph with its light and shines through it, and there is a giant screen, and all of a sudden, I, on the screen, I see sin in all its hideousness, its, its foulness, its hatred, its destruction. Everything that is, it's, everything that's not God, I begin to see it, and it came through the light of the law, through the light of the law. It came to a fullness. In the fullness of time, our Lord Jesus came into the world. It came to a fullness. Jesus came to, it came to a fullness in Israel, God's chosen people. It's as if the law lured sin into one place, namely the nation itself, who is given the law, and it did its worst. It became full of hatred and, and horrid. Here, Jesus said it was, it was a, a trap to get sin concentrated in one place. He even told a story one time. He said, he said a, a king went off and left a vineyard and, and said, take care of it. Take, take care of my, this, this is mine. You, you take care of it. And the people didn't. And he would send all kind of people. And finally, remember, he said, I'll send my son. And they will honor him. But they said, here's what the evil people said. Here comes the son. We'll kill him and take the kingdom. How little does Satan know? You know, evil is not smart. The one behind it is not smart. Paul once said, uh, if, if these powers and principalities understood what they were doing, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. Mm. They never would have done that. And so here is all the sin of the world. This... Uh, John the Baptist, here comes Messiah. Look, here comes the Lamb of God who does what? Who takes away the sin of what? The world. The entirety. One point. And Jesus dies and he cries, it is finished. Atonement is made. Real actuality of atonement is fulfilled. It's done. Father has dealt with sin. God in Christ is reconciling the world unto Himself. And so now this great gospel goes out to all the world, saying to everyone who will believe, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And you will become a part of a royal household, a spirit-filled family, a holy nation, a real priesthood. And you'll begin to reflect the Holy Spirit who is in you. Jesus sums up Israel in himself. First of all, as perfect. He was a perfect Israelite. He was without sin. He summed up everything in himself. And so we, in him, by faith, become spirit people. So what's true of Jesus is true of all who are in him. He is the chosen one, therefore in him we become what? Chosen of God. 
And what a great salvation. I, I like to think about that. We are heirs with God and joint heirs with Christ. I'm, I'm going to go there. All right. What are we? Well, as you came in this morning, Mary did a little thing. I'm going to close by just reading this. I want you to take it home. It's a little piece of paper. Who are you if you're in Christ Jesus? If you're, in the, if you're a part of the church of Jesus Christ, you don't have to be a part of this church, although most of you here are. I, I want you to see who you are. Number one, we are the church, an eschatological community. Eschato, simply a Greek word meaning goal or end. We're living now, okay? We're a community which lives and moves as new covenant people. Number two, our foundation for life together. How is it that we can live together? How is it that we can work together? How is it that we can see ourselves as brothers and sisters? Well, our foundation is a gracious and merciful God who is full of love toward all. Thus, by the Spirit, we can be full of love toward each other. Wouldn't that be nice? And love does a lot of things. It covers over. It, it takes, doesn't take offense. It, it is quick to forgive. It doesn't keep accounts. And say, well, you know, last year you were really mean to me. Now, I, look here, I've got, I've got it down here. I wrote it down in my account book. It doesn't do that. It doesn't do that. It keeps no account like that. Matter of fact, it always believes the best about everybody. Oh, I'm glad for my wife to do that. <laughs> and she loves me. The framework... The eschatological goal is an existence marked. We will be marked by this, the already and the not yet. Already we are sons of God, and yet we do not see completely what we shall be. Number four, our focus is Jesus. We'll obey what the writer of Hebrews said, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Him. Son of God, who is God's suffering servant Messiah, effected salvation for all who will believe and receive Him as Lord through His life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and sending Holy Spirit, and who is even now Lord of the nations, King of kings and Lord of... He's not going to be king. He is king now. And we go around saying, He's Lord. What do you think of that? Number five, thus we can live now without condemnation. We can live now without being weighed down with guilt. Wouldn't that be nice? No more condemnation as we await Christ's coming. Live the life of the future by the power of the Spirit. The final salvation, a resurrected body, awaits us. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in us, in you, then He who raised Jesus from the dead will give life to your, our mortal bodies through His Spirit who is living in us. I have gone too long. I apologize. Now, you'll have to forgive me. <laughs> See how I set that up? <laughs> You will have to do that. But we're, we're, we're not going to be in a hurry, are we? Uh, prayer teams, I want you to begin to come. Come on down now. All those who are going to be praying, our musicians, come forward, please. This is a time for an opportunity, an opportunity. If you wish to pray with somebody, you say, well, well Brother Jack, boy, I, I, I'm, I'm not living like I should. Well, okay. Come and have Miss I pray with you and for you. With you and for you. These are people who will be happy, to, and they're going to anoint you with oil. Anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. Because James said, that's what we do. We anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. And so if you have a need, if you have someone, I want you to come during this time, just for a brief time, and let's come and let's pray.